Welcome, everyone, to Tea Time with Lee and Lowe Books. I'm Louise May, Editor-at-Large at Lee and Lowe. I'm here today with three of my favorite authors, Monica Brown, Sandra Nichol, and Katherine Russell Brown. It's been a real honor for me as an editor to have worked with each of them on a picture book biography that has just been published this fall. So I'd like to start with each of you introducing yourself and telling us briefly um, who your book is about and why you think it's important for young readers to, sh to know about that person. And I'm going to show the cover starting with uh, Mon uh, who's coming up first. Let's see. Sorry, this is OK. Um, Sandra, why don't you start with your... Okay. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Nichol, and I'm the author of Nachos, Nachos. It's the true story of how nachos were invented. And the reason I think it's great for kids is because it's about an ordinary hero. It's, it's not somebody who was a soccer star or a Nobel Prize winner. It was just somebody going through, by through their everyday life. He was working in his restaurant in Zing like that, he had this inspiration of an idea and he created something that's now loved by everybody all over the world. Okay, and I'm having a little there. Okay, Sandra. I mean, sorry, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Hello, I'm Catherine Russell Brown, author of She Was the First. Uh, I wrote this book about Shirley Anita St. Hill Chisholm, um, who was the first black woman in Congress. Uh, she was elected to Congress in 1968. And she was also, uh, and this isn't uh, stated uh, very often, but she was also the first black person, woman or man to run for president. Uh, on one of the two uh, major party tickets. So I wrote it because I wanted her to be celebrated and known to little people. Okay, and here we go, here's Shiruko. Monica? Hi, I'm, my name is Monica Brown, and it is my delight to present my latest picture book on Shiruko, um, El Arqueologo Peruano, Peruvian archeologist, Julio C. Cayo. And I picked this figure to write about uh, for all sorts of reasons, but he was the first indigenous archeologist and the greatest of all the Americas. And I wanted to celebrate this Peruvian hero as a Peruvian American. And I also wanted to share the ways he was among the first indigenous people to tell his own stories and to teach about ancient indigenous history and living indigenous history. Thank you. Three wonderful books, if I must say so myself. Um, so probably uh, the question you get asked uh, most often is something like, what inspired you to write your book? So uh, why don't we start with that? Um, Catherine, why don't you start us off? Well, um, Shirley Chisholm in some way has always been with me. I remember when she ran for president in 1972, I was just in elementary school, but I remember her run and I remember being kind of stung by the reactions uh, people had to her. She was uh, really, she really bore the brunt of a lot of um, crude, sexist uh, comments. So I, I kind of felt, um, in some ways, I just, you know, I, I cared about her and I cared that she was kind of being publicly um, aligned. And I had all, also had a soft spot because she looks a lot like my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother. Uh, and when I heard that she passed in 2005, it was also the same year that my kids were born. So she'd kind of been kind of uh, simmering uh, in the background in terms of ideas for uh, writing, so. Uh, who'd like to go next, Monica? Sure. Um, so I, like Catherine, have a personal connection to Julio C.K.O. If you can believe it, my mother, Isabel 
Maria Brown, uh, Vexler Valdivieso, was born on Julio C. Taylor, not born, she lived during her teen years on Julio C. Teo Boulevard oh, wow. in Lima, Peru. Um, and I'm behind me as a painting. She was an artist and she was so full of pride for her culture. She immigrated to the United States. So I'm the daughter of an immigrant, a South American mother and a North American father. And from telling me things like uh, potatoes were are from Peru to sharing so many aspects of the culture and us going back and forth when I was a child to Peru. Um, he took me and my children on our very last trip to the house on Julio Citeo where she lived. And so she shared this story of this incredible man who was, who was a native Quechua speaker. And I do think that uh, this book may be the very first book published in the United States by uh, for children that has Quechua in the title. And I'm honoring my mother and grandmother's indigenous heritage, their mestizaje, and um, celebrating this figure that so contributed to uh, through the knowledge of indigenous history and culture and the richness of the contributions. So like I said, this figure, this name, Julio Citeo, I always knew, you would go and visit the house in the Lince neighborhood in Pura, the, in Peru, in Lima, excuse me, because my mom was born in Pura in northern Peru. And so when I had a chance as an as a established writer to bring this knowledge of a deeper knowledge of Latinx culture and the contributions of South Americans, I was super excited. Oh. Okay, Sandra, it's your turn. Oh, yeah. Well, I love that both Catherine and Monica have these personal connections. Um, for me, um, I was excited um, to write this story because, I mean, I'm a big Nacho fan, but when I discovered there was this generous, hardworking man who invented this snack eaten all over the world, um, but that nobody knows about him, um, I, I found it incredibly unjust. And the reason I wanted to write about it is so that people would know his story that anybody, you know, kids, um, adults, anybody who sees um, um, Oliver Dominguez's great fo photo, his cover of him, that they get to realize that Ignacio Anaya is the man behind nachos, that the snack that we all love. I think you all um, answered my next question, which was, uh, were there any events in your childhood that predisposed you to writing about the person you wrote about? So, um, I, is there anything else that any of you would like to add about that, or we could move on to the next question? Okay, next well, question. I would say that I think for me, uh, I wanted to write for my children the stories I would have liked to read when I was younger. So that motivates a lot of what I, what right. I write about. Uh, okay, so I think as, um, hopefully you noticed each of your books has a subtitle. Why do you think it was important to have a subtitle? Um, who'd like to start? Catherine? Sure. Um, well, first of all, because it includes Shirley Chisholm's name. <laughs> so we thought that was important. Um, and also, one of the things that she was very clear about in her speeches um, and just in interviews was that she didn't want to just be known as the first, right? So she opened the door uh, and, you know, uh, was able to walk through that door, but that isn't all that she did. She wasn't just the first Black woman in Congress, uh, you know, first in the assembly in New York. And so uh, I wanted to have another piece in the title that reflected that her life was really one of being a trailblazer, but it wasn't limited to her uh, being uh, the first one to walk through the door. And I, I really relate to what you're saying, Catherine, because I like to say Sharuko was the first and greatest um, mm -hmm. and the most, one of the most important archeologists of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And for the same reason, I wanted his a proper name in the title, especially because Sharuko is a Quechua word meaning brave, 
Um, and so that might not be instantly recognizable, but I'm very grateful to Louise and all the Lee and Lowe team for letting me use his nickname because it was so tied to his identity as well. Well, I think uh, both with your book, Monica, and your book, Catherine, um, we went back and forth a lot about the title and the subtitle. Um, Sandra's came through with that title that it has, and <laughs> there was <laughs> no, no big uh, discussion about it. It was a perfect title. But uh, Sandra, what do you think about the subtitle? Well, no, the reason I think it's important, so the subtitle on Nachos Nachos is the story behind the world's favorite snack. Um, because I think that's important because I think a lot of people think nachos are Tex-Mex. They think it's, you know, just something we eat in America. But they were invented in Mexico and people all, all over the world eat them. And that adds significance to what Ignacio and Naya did and also in a way to the tragedy. There are people, all over the world saying his name in restaurants and people don't know it's because of Ignacio Naya. So um, that's why I think it's important that Worlds um, is part of that subtitle. Okay, so now that we've talked about the titles, let's talk about, let's hear some of your stories. So um, Monica, why don't you start us off reading from Shiruko? Sure, um, and I do want to shout out my illustrator, Elisa Chavati, who is a Peruvian American. She did the most amazing job with this book, so including the end papers. So I'll just read the first two pages, and I'd like to read it. It's a bilingual book, so I'd like to read it in English and Spanish. Um, I'll start with the English, and then, although in the book, we have the Spanish first on the left hand spread, and then the right have the English. So this is the story of Julio Cifeo, one of the most important archaeologists in all the Americas. He was born in Peru on April 11, 1880 in the rugged highlands just outside the capital city of Lima in the shadow of the Andes Mountains. Julio and his family were indigenous. Their ancestors had lived in this region of Peru for generations. They spoke Quechua, the language of the great Inca empire that is still spoken by many native people in Peru. And I'll show you an image of where uh, Julio Teo lived. And Spanish is my second language, but I'll do my best for you. Esta es la historia de Julio Citeo, uno de los arqueólogos más importantes de todas las Américas. Nació en el Perú en el 11 de abril de 1880 bajo la sombra de los Andes en la escarpada zona montañosa a las afueras de su capital, Lima. Julio y su familia eran indígenas. Sus ancestros habían habitado esta región de Perú por varias generaciones. Hablaban quechua, el idioma del gran imperio inca, que aún habla mucha de la población, población indígena de Perú. I'll just read one more page. And this is fun um, because Julio, as a child, was an explorer. He was brave. He was adventurous. And he would explore places near his house. So I'll show you um, the image first. As a boy, Julio was brave and curious. This earned him the nickname Charuco, which means brave in Quechua. Charuco was always seeking, searching, and exploring. The caves and burial grounds he found in the foothills of Paricata, a snow-covered peak in the Andes. He was fascinated by the bones and pottery and other mysteries hidden in the earth. Nothing scared Shiruko, not even the skulls he and his brothers uncovered in ancient tombs. De niño, Julia era valiente y curioso. Por eso lo llamaban Shiruko, que significa valiente en Quechua. Shiruko siempre buscaba, examinaba y exploraba las cuevas de los antiguo, antiguos cemeterios en las laderas de los picos nevados de Paricata, en los Andes. 
Le fascinaban los huesos, la cerámica y todos los misterios escondidos bajo la tierra. Nada le daba miedo al charuto, ni siquiera los cráneos que él y sus hermanos descubrieron en las antiguas tumbas. And I'll stop there to give my colleagues a chance. <laughs> okay. Stories. Okay. Uh, Sandra, how about let's hear from Nachos Nachos. Okay. So I'll read the first two pages also. And I'll start off by showing the pictures. So I don't know if you can see. There's Nacho's foster mother. And there is Nacho eating. And so in 1895, a baby boy was born in northern Mexico. His name was Ignacio Anaya. And like a lot of Ignacios, he was called Nacho for short. Nacho's parents died when he was young, and he went to live with a foster mother. He loved to sit in the kitchen while she made quesadillas. She warmed corn tortillas, folded cheese inside, and toasted them until they were golden on the outside and melted on the inside. Nacho ate one quesadilla after the other. And then for the picture again, you see him there eating his quesadillas. Nacho learned about cooking from his foster mother. And as he grew older, he became quite good at other tasks around the kitchen too. When Nacho turned 23, he found a job at a restaurant. He was willing to do whatever was needed. Seat guests, pass out menus, take orders, and serve meals. As Nacho went from table to table, people smiled. He had a special talent for making diners happy. And here he is making everybody happy, as everyone says he did. And I will pass it over to Catherine now. Great. All right, so here is the first illustration. And shout out to Eric Velasquez, uh, who was the illustrator. He did a marvelous job. Um, the pictures just jump off the page. Um, OK, I'll start. On a cold November day in 1924, Shirley Anita St. Hill came into this world. Back then, nobody had an inkling that she would open the door to history. Shirley, the oldest of the St. Hill girls, was a handful for Mama and Papa. From the time she was little, Shirley liked to be in charge. At three, she was already leading children twice her age around the neighborhood, telling them where to go and which games to play. Listen to me, Shirley said, and they did. The next page shows her at home with her mother father and um, sibling. The St. Hill family lived in Brooklyn, New York. Papa was a baker's helper and mother was a seamstress and domestic worker. They barely earned enough money to keep food in the cupboards and supper on the table. Mother and Papa made a tough decision. They would send the girls to live with mother's family on the Caribbean island of Barbados. While the children were away, Papa and mother would save their money and Shirley and her sisters would get a taste of country living. Do you want me to read the, the third spread, Louise, or? Sure, why not? Okay, I wanted, to get, I wanted her to get to Barbados <laughs> <laughs> in this story. So here she is arriving, and I'll say the text in just a moment, arriving from the US. Okay. In 1928, Shirley, her sisters and mother boarded an ocean liner named the Balkania. After nine rocky days at sea, they arrived in Barbados. From the port, they rode a rickety bus to grandmother Emmeline's farm. Shirley spotted her grandmother right away. The thin West Indian woman stood as tall as a reed and she looked like serious business. What I love about each of these stories is that it starts by telling us about the person's childhood. So we really get a picture of uh, where they came from and how their early experiences actually led them to what they um, accomplished later. Um, so let's, next question here is, 
uh, you know, biographies and actually nonfiction in general require a lot of research. Uh, I know all three of you did a ton of research for your book. And so research can take many paths. And I would like each of you to kind of tell us um, about the research that you did for your book. So how about Sandra? Why don't you start us off? Sure. So, um, so I started off scouring the internet, like maybe a lot of people do. Um, back then, this was six years ago when I started, there really wasn't that much out about the invention of nachos. People said that Ignacio Anaya was the inventor. They thought it probably happened in Piezas Negras, Coahuila, which is right across the Rio Grande from Eagle Pass, Texas. And they thought, um, they thought it was maybe invented for a woman named Mamie Feynman. But other than that, the details weren't clear at all. So I spent a couple of months trying to find a way to find um, Nacho's family and maybe the families of the other main players. And I had really great luck when I contacted the Eagle Pass Chamber of Commerce because Sandra Martin is there. She knew everybody connected. Remember, these, these are sister cities, Piedras Negras and, um, and Eagle Pass, Texas. And so she called everybody for me and she made the introduction um, for me. And so I got to make the connection. And then I went to, down to Eagle Pass and to Piedras Negras, met with everybody I could, even the folks who organized um, a three-day event called the Nacho Fest. Um, I got to see the original nachos being made. Um, people were incredibly generous. They asked people for photographs, called people, sent me things. And then when I went back home, um, I still continued emailing with everybody and they asked, answered every small question you can imagine. Um, but even, even with that, I felt like I wanted to try to get closer to the time because nachos were invented in 1940 and I'm talking to people now. And so I went back and doubled down on my research. And um, I saw in a, just in, in a footnote somewhere, somebody had referenced a 1959 article in the San Antonio Express and News. So I contacted the Texas Library and Archives, asked them if they had it. And they said, no, they didn't. But they, was, they were pretty sure if um, I used a, um, uh, a website that I had to pay a fee to enter in to look at all their microfilms that I could probably find it on there. And that was again, a really great jackpot for me because there was not only one article, but two articles where the reporter had um, interviewed Ignacio Anaya himself. And so I got to see the story in his own words, which was so very, very important to me. And after I had that with everything else I'd done already, I finally felt that I had the story that I was gonna tell. Okay, who'd like to go next? Monica? Sure. Um, so the question is about my sources and research. This is always very important to me because what we are writing creative nonfiction when we write uh, picture book biographies and we need to have lyricism and inspiration and find moments that tell a great narrative. But we also want to honor the history and do our research and I feel a, a special responsibility for that when I as someone who's written a lot of um, books either inspired by living people like Waiting for the Biblioburo or um, like Sharuko about uh, a living uh, a person who lived and made an impact so I'm a former journalist I'm also a professor who has done research and so that's a very important part of my process um, for this book, I consulted all sorts of materials. I'm very privileged and grateful that I'm bilingual because I could look at materials that have resources in Peru. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was also an amazing collection published of Julio Cipeo's writings in translation by Dr. An edited collection by Dr. Richard Burke, uh, Berger at Yale University, and I consulted a Peruvian archaeologist's uh, book by his name is Dr. Henry Pampaleam. And because uh, it was very important for me to get the facts of this story right, I had Dr. Berger and Dr. Pampaleam 
both archaeologists, one rooted, one uh, based in Peru and one based here in the U.S., review the manuscript and offer feedback. Um, I feel like it's incredibly important to be, to honor the subjects I work with. So, for example, when I've written about uh, Dolores Huerta, I've consulted with her and she's reviewed the manuscript in my book side by side, lado a lado, and given me her blessing. Um, whenever possible, I think that's the best way to go. Sure. And try to have the work have some benefit to the communities you're writing about. So um, that's a little bit about my process. I do extensive research and then pull out the ideas and moments that I think will inspire and educate children about these individual lives. Um, and I think that's what I was able to do with Sharuto because we know that the stereotype of the archeologist and, and a lot of children just think dinosaur bones and Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> But and Sharuko had those exciting moments of discovery and adventure that did involve uh, bones and uh, treasures, but he had a larger mission, and that was to make this history available to all Peruvians and to use this knowledge of the amazing contributions of indigenous peoples to lift up uh, indigenous culture at a time when there was enormous discrimination against the indigenous groups and crew, which of course there still is, and make it accessible publicly, as well as his efforts to conserve this heritage and sites. So that's a little bit about my process. I know that I think there's more questions in the chat already that we can <laughs> Okay, Catherine, your turn. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a, it, it feels like a, a heavy but welcome weight to write a story about an actual person. And so I share some of what Monica has shared in terms of uh, approach. Um, and so in many ways, it just is right in my wheelhouse because my day job is a lot of research <laughs> and writing. Um, so I started off by reading, um, rereading her first uh, autobiography and then reading her second reading biographies of her, uh, and thankfully, because she was a, uh, uh, Shirley Chisholm was a well-known figure, there's a lot uh, out there on her, a lot of interviews, online, videos, um, uh, you know, uh, attesting to her uh, wonderful storytelling um, abilities, and you know, I tried to locate photos. I mean, I just tried to get a big picture of who she was. And the fun part, the exciting part is parsing it down. But no matter what, whenever I'm in the middle of uh, research for a children's book, I always think, well, maybe this should be for middle grade so I can get all these good juicy <laughs> things right. in here, right? I want the story to be longer and more and I want to get it all in there. Um, but so that's, um, yeah, that's, um, that's always, um, you know, the, the, the part that's hard is figuring out which of the things that have happened kind of tell a bigger story and will resonate with uh, young people. Um, but yeah, so, you know, reading, reading newspaper articles, reading books, um, you know, looking for people who knew her, trying to confirm information um, that was, um, was readily available. Um, yeah, just diving in. That's great. So now, um, for each of you, um, although you are authors, the illustrations are an integral part of the picture book. And you have all shown some of the illustrations already. But um, I think you each pulled out, asked me to show two particular spreads from your book that you wanted to talk about that you feel um, helped to really tell the story um, that you wanted to tell. So we'll start with, uh, I have a screen share here of two illustrations from Shiruko by uh, the illustrator, Alyssa Shivari, who Monica said is also Peruvian. So uh, we were very happy to have her on board and she was thrilled to do this uh, book for us. So let me get to that. And let me 
here we are. Okay, Monica, jump in. Sure. Um, it was difficult to choose just two illustrations to talk about because I do, I'm such a fan of Elisa Shavari. I just, we both put our hearts into this book and she is amazing. So I'm very honored to work with her. I thought I'd include, if you look at the top of your screen, really what was the absolute most challenging spread to right. create. And it was because how do you really illustrate something as traumatic and devastating as colonization? Um, if you can read the text, it talks, I'm gonna go ahead and read it to explain it. For centuries, the indigenous people of Peru were treated unfairly and faced discrimination. This started in the 1500s when Spanish soldiers invaded Peru. The Spanish were looking for gold and when they found it, they claimed the land and its riches for himself. themselves. They established control by killing many native Peruvians and rejecting their belief systems. The Spanish destroyed temples and cities all in the pursuit of wealth and power. So the first sketch actually looked nothing like this and it was a larger figure of Francisco Pizarro uh, grabbing gold because uh, not surprisingly, when we think of power imbalance, balances even today, greed and wealth uh, and economics are involved in that. But I didn't want to center uh, the colonizer and I wanted to show the devastating effects in a way that I didn't think would sort of create trauma for children. And so I did want to show though the transition. And I've found fire is always metaphorically a good way to um, deal with images of war. And I wanted certainly there to be a, a vision if you see at the left side of the panel of the beauty and the peace and the uh, uh, not the peacefulness, because it's not that all cultures are pe peaceful, but I wanted to show a transition of what happens. So instead of having the colonizer central, they are a shadow, fig shadowy figures in the back that are bringing smoke. And I did want to put at the center the, this pillaging for wealth. And if you see to the right of the panel, you see what I have seen in, in Cusco, in it, uh, which is that the Spaniards literally built their buildings on top of uh, the stones laid by the indigenous peoples of Peru. So that those are, uh, Elisa did very careful work in looking at these, these buildings um, and looking at the architecture of Cusco. And I, though this is sort of me metaphorical and symbolic, I do think it depicts in a way that children can understand this transformation that happened during the period of colonization, which I note in the, in the afterward, Julio Citeo thought was the great catastrophe um, of the, the history of Peru and the Americas. So that was a challenging spread. I know, uh, you know, I hope that what Elisa and I put out feels honest and true. I think you can write about difficult things for children. It's good to write with some hope. And indeed, uh, Teo's life is a story of hope and an unlikely story in this, because of how really persecuted and how much prejudice there was in his lifetime against indigenous Peruvians. And so the next, there's so many, uh, stories I could tell, but the next spread I chose, because partially I don't like to give away what happens, and this is an early scene. Um, I will say that after the scene of co colonization, there's a beautiful scene of his father telling him stories, which his father did about Peru's history that has beautiful images. And later on, there's images of the incredible textiles and of the skulls that indigenous people perform successful brain surgeries. There's just so many amazing things that defy stereotypes about Peruvian culture and in particular indigenous culture. And that's what fascinated and drove uh, Sharuko. But this little scene where he's driving, he's uh, traveling on horseback to go to Lima to study. It's a remarkable story. What had to line up for this brilliant indigenous 
boy to have the opportunity to study. Well, one big thing that lined up was his Tia Maria, who was a maid, a housekeeper, a servant. The language then was different in the presidential palace. Uh, and so had enough to help support his journey. While Sharuko was in Lima, he also worked carrying bags um, in the train station to support himself. And he ended up through his brilliance uh, being, Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. I tend to talk too long, Louise. And no, I, can I, wasn't to, I wasn't giving you a hint. <laughs> no, I'm going to give myself a, a, a cut off myself. Um, <laughs> but I just thought it was remarkable that how many brilliant indigenous peoples in Peru and at any time in history, any group that have been repressed and discriminated against, how many had everything line up where he happened to have an aunt in the presidential palace, right. happened to become friends with Ricardo Palma, the son of Peru's famous, famous junior, famous librarian and scholar who helped him get jobs. So many things had to happen that part of it makes me sad that how many stories do not end like Sharuko's. But in this moment of hope, he's on horseback going to the big city for the first time. Thank you. And now we have two spreads with their corresponding reference photos um, from Nachos Nachos. Yeah, and so um, like, like my honored um, co-speakers today, I'm a great fan of Oliver Dominguez, my illustrator also. I think he did a, just a fabulous job. Um, in the top, um, on the top, what you see there is there's Ignacio Anaya welcoming um, Mamie Finan to the Victory Club. And to the right, there's a newspaper clipping of Kenton Floss, who was a famous Mexican, well, also a Hollywood actor. And he was down at the Victory Club where nachos were invented. And he was directing the Victory Club Orchestra. And um, what I think is so great about this is that Oliver has picked up every single little detail to give kids the true experience of what it must have been like to be there. It wasn't you know, a little cantina, you know, we think of nachos as casual, a casual food right now, but this was a very elegant restaurant. Not, look at Nacho, he's such a handsome dresser. In fact, he's a handsome dresser in every photo I've seen of him. He's always got his button down shirt on and a tie. And, and you see the orchestra in the background and the white tablecloths. And I think it's really, it, it, it's, and his colors are so inviting that it draws kids into this other world so they can really have this experience of being there in the home of where nachos, nachos were, were invented. And then on the bottom um, to the right is um, a photo that Rodolfo de los Santos, who's the son of Rodolfo de los Santos Sr., who was the owner of the Victory Club, he gave this photo to me. And um, again, Oliver has done, picked up all the details. You've got the awning with the stripe on it. And you've got the neon lights. And uh, you've got this beautiful blue lighting of the evening as Mamie comes out and tells everybody about this fantastic snack that she's just had. Um, and, but because of these really vivid colors, I think it's so wonderful for kids because you, your eye is just drawn in. You can't help but looking at it and getting excited and drawn into the excitement of the spread that Oliver has created. Okay, and now we have Illustrations by Eric Velasquez for She Was the First. Okay, so I love these illustrations. And so with the first one on the left, I really wanted to show that she was part of a family, that she's not just this person who's kind of, you know, um, traveling along on her own and that she obviously had siblings, um, but also to see her with her dad, who she loved and greatly admired and respected. And her dad was kind of an intellectual spark for her. Her dad read three newspapers a day, uh, was an avid follower of Marcus Garvey, who was a proponent of uh, Back to Africa movement. And what uh, we're told that 
um, Shirley Chisholm got from uh, some of the language and listening in, and that's her in that second spread at the top, listening uh, behind uh, the door. She's in her bedroom and there are men out in the living room talking about the world, talking about politics and talking about uh, race and talking about um, how people should be treated fa be treated fairly regardless uh, of race. So I wanted to show kind of the generational um, aspect to her learning about uh, political issues right at home and also to show uh, what we now call a, a girl dad, <laughs> right? Um, and as well uh, to show a, a black girl um, who's just crazy about her dad. <laughs> Uh, so with the one on the bottom, uh, so she's come a long way. And uh, what this shows is her uh, giving a talk uh, in Congress. And she's there, um, you know, petite, short, you know, 5'2", 108 uh, pounds. <laughs> Shirley Chisholm is there laying it out, uh, giving a speech. And she's there in a room where all uh, people who... Um, have, uh, you know, don't think she belongs there. They are listening uh, to her. So I just really wanted to, and I think uh, Eric Velasquez does a, just an amazing job of showing kind of the largeness of the room and how she's there with the, you know, the colors, the, the, what she has on is different from you know, the colors we see with other people. And she's got her hand out. She's very authoritative and, you know, clear. Uh, and so that's um, that's what I love about these these two. I think it, to me, uh, I love all of the art, um, and each one is a very different style, but works so well with the story, um, the time, and the place, and the characters. Mm -hmm. So uh, my next question. Um, I'd like to know for each of you, what are the rewards and challenges of writing biographies or other nonfiction for young readers? And more specifically, um, Catherine and Monica, you both wrote from uh, about a person or a culture or from a culture or a race that is the same or close to your own, while Sandra, you wrote cross-culturally. So what were the specific responsibilities you felt about doing this and how did you ensure authenticity and cultural sensitivity? Um, whoever would like to start, just start. Should I call on one of you? <laughs> well, how about I, Catherine? I, okay, Catherine. Oh, oh, all right, did you want to start, Sandra? No, no, but let Catherine start, let Catherine start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of it is what Monica mentioned earlier, and I think I said a little bit as well, and that is I feel a particular, um, you know, it's a weight, but it's a, it's a good weight uh, to tell, uh, tell the truth, uh, to be accurate, uh, you know, real big focus on getting it right. You don't want uh, some wonderful librarian reading and say, wait a minute, I don't know if that's right, <laughs> right? So checking and rechecking. Um, but yeah, so uh, so you know, there's definitely. I mean, I, I felt an affinity to, uh, you know, her experiences as um, African American uh, and as an African American woman. Um, so yeah, there's a concern about getting it right, and I also was concerned that she not just be shown as someone who did this one thing and did this one other thing and did something else, but that she had a life separate from politics. I really wanted to show that. Um, she had a family. She, you know, had a very supportive uh, partner, uh, and that she loved to dance. Um, I don't know. I couldn't find what kind of music she liked, but I know that she loved to dance. Uh, so I, I felt um, a particular push to um, tell her story uh, and humanize her in ways that weren't just about her working. Oh, Sandra. Yeah, um, well, I, the greatest reward, without a doubt, is introducing kids to an unknown hero. Nothing beats that. Um, but as Catherine said, and as Monica said before, I felt um, a huge responsibility to Ignacio and I. Um, there's a lot of um, things wrong on the, on the internet. Um, even last year, Google came out with a doodle, and 
the image doesn't look anything like him. And Google and Wikipedia put up a photo that wasn't him. And, um, and they didn't follow Spanish naming cultures in their article. And so all these news outlets all over the United States were calling him Garcia because that's his mother's last name. Um, and, and, and it's enormously frustrating. And the Anaya family finds it enormously frustrating also. And so I feel um, so lucky to have been, I don't know, on this journey with them. I mean, if you, when you read Nachos Nachos, you'll see that um, I wrote it, um, well, I wonder what Monica would say since she's a former journalist, but I tried to write it more in a journalistic way. I didn't use my imagination. Um, I tried to only go with, you know, with the facts that, you know, I could take from the articles and that the pictures said. And, um, and then when I was finished, I, um, I took my words and I showed them to Luis and I, uh, um, to Rodolfo and Patti de los Santos. Um, and in the same way, they were blessed because I, it, it's, I think the responsibility you feel um, for your subject is even bigger when you're writing cross-culturally. I mean, you really, you really want to do the right thing by your subject. And so, um, and even now, um, since the book has come out, I've written Google five times now telling them that they have the wrong picture up in their, <laughs> their box. And they finally put one little picture that's right and there's like three other pictures that are wrong. Um, and, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully they'll get it right soon. Okay, Monica. Yes, well, I think it's important to say that uh, Sharuko was indigenous Peruvian, and I, while I have indigenous Peruvian heritage by way of my mother and grandmother, I am not indigenous Peruvian. So, even though uh, I'm very proudly Peruvian American, I was also always aware of my own subject position when I write. I do think that experiential knowledge is wonderful, and I certainly have that in terms of. Peruvian culture and being bilingual as well. Um, but in terms of why nonfiction is important, I think that it can really supplement a curriculum in the school. So that's one thing I love about it. And I have been told by librarians and teachers that um, there's more because of the various politics perhaps, there's more support for buying nonfiction picture books. And I certainly know that the, the curriculum guide created for this book around uh, Sharuko and Peruvian history and the history sometimes problematic of archeology span and indigenous cultures is amazing, written by uh, Monica Oliveira, my tokaya. Um, and so because I'm a teacher, I've been, I teach big, Big, not, I won't say kids, I teach uh, young adults and, and older adults at the university. I want to support teachers. And I think nonfiction picture books ha are a really special way to do that for younger children. So I'm not sure, I was so uh, fascinated listening to Catherine and Sandra. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Louise. No, but okay. We have lots of great questions in the Q&A, so I definitely yeah. want to save time for that. Yeah, I, we, we've had the experience with some of our uh, picture book biographies. We've heard from college professors that use them as an entree when they're talking about a particular subject. And they'll read the picture book first before they, you know, even start in on a subject. So just one last question before we go to the Q&A is, um, is there any advice they, any of you would like to share with others who are wanting to write biographies or nonfiction? I can start with that okay, because sure. I teach writing workshops on this. First, read a lot. I read in the field. Read and see how the books that you most admire or that children respond to um, are supported, are, are structured. There's so many different ways in, even with nonfiction biographies, third person, first person, uh, framed 
in the present and going back to the past, traditional, chronological. There's just so many, the form of the book is important. Um, so study that by reading great, great uh, picture book biographers. And then also, again, I'm just echoing what Sandra and Catherine said, do meticulous research. And my, what I do is as I research moments that are particularly delightful or inspiring or important for children, I pull out in notes. Um, and sometimes that shapes the story and sometimes it doesn't. And I could go on, but, but I'll turn it over to my fellow writers. So Sandra, Catherine, any, any other words of advice? I would, I would just add that, you know, make sure you're absolutely in love with your subject because you're going to be spending a lot of time with this person and it should be a real joy to research and learn so much. I mean, there's so many fascinating details you will work and as, as Monica and Catherine both alluded to before, you have to parse through all these gems of information you're going to get and, and try to boil them down. and. And, um, and if you're in love with who you're writing about, it's, it's not a chore, it's a joy. Yeah, I would just add that at the beginning, you may not know where you're going, you might not know what the big takeaway points will be in the book, but it's the reading, it's the synthesizing, it's the thinking about, and there'll be many ahas and oh no's <laughs> uh, along the way. But I do agree, you, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, a whole life is involved, right? So you're, you're looking through um, all kinds of different information and it's great if you're excited about um, and at least interested in uh, the person that you're writing about. So I am now looking at the Q&A and actually um, I think we've covered all these, <laughs> we've already answered all these questions. So um, I think maybe we, can wrap up. Uh, I have one more screen share for you guys. Just uh, okay. So let's go. Oops. There we go. Okay. Just a reminder for everybody: these are our books um, that were published this month. They all have received terrific reviews, including starred reviews, and they are now available for you to read and share with youngsters. So uh, thank you, Catherine, Sandra, and Monica, and Shirley, Nacho, and Shiruko for participating in Leah Lowe's Tea Time Talks. And thanks to everyone who has joined us and tuned into this latest episode. Our next Tea Time Talk We'll have author and photographer Jan Reynolds in conversation with editor Cheryl Klein about Jan's newest book, The Lion Queens of India. This will be on Thursday, September 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Stay tuned, everyone. So long.